Uh, hello. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our second Climate Week 2020 uh, event. Uh, this is Mike Harrington, one of the assistant directors at the Tishman Environment and Design Center, um, who was working on basically bringing this together. And this is going to be our uh, climate justice in New York City and adjustments in a discussion with the climate change and environmental justice leaders uh, in New York City uh, discussion. So a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll get started. Uh, so we, we'd like that everyone mutes your device during the presentation. Um, so we'll have some time for questions, but we'd like that you use the Zoom chat feature to put the questions uh, into there. And then I will pick a couple of questions and then we'll have the panel talk about them. And lastly, the session will be recorded and posted on the Tishman Center website. Uh, and we'll also have it on YouTube as well. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the director of the Tishman Center, uh, Joel Towers. Thank you, Mike. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody. It's fantastic to see that we have uh, almost 100 people here already. And I, I think this will be a really um, vibrant and important conversation. I'm particularly thankful to our guests for joining us today. Uh, I will do a very brief introduction of each of them, uh, followed by a, a couple of introductory comments, um, setting the frame for our discussion. And then um, each of them will begin uh, with their comments and response, and then we'll have some back and forth and time for your questions. Um, so please, uh, if you do have questions, um, post them to the chat. Uh, Mike will be monitoring that and we'll make sure to pull those questions in. Um, so uh, please uh, welcome our four panelists, Peggy Shepard, Adriana Espinoza, Dr. Christian Branian, and Dr. Anna Baptista. Um, Peggy Shepard is the Executive Director of WEACT for Environmental Justice uh, and uh, is the co-founder and Executive Director of WEACT. Um, she has a long history of organizing and engaging Northern Manhattan residents in community-based planning and campaigns to address environmental protection and environmental health policy, both locally and nationally. She's successfully combined grassroots organizing, environmental advocacy, and environmental health community-based participatory research to become a national leader in advancing environmental policy and the perspective of environmental justice in urban communities to ensure that the right to clean, healthy, and sustainable environment extends to all. Adriana Espinoza. Adriana Espinoza is the Senior Advisor for Environmental Justice in the Mayor's Office of Climate Policy and Programs. She joined the Mayor's Office of Climate Policy and Programs from the New York League of Conservation Vo Voters where she has worked on a wide variety of environmental health and justice issues, including the successful, ad, successful advocacy and public education campaigns from clean school buses to lead free New York, to lead free New York City. She has extensive experience building broad-based coalitions and will serve um, uh, the mayor's office uh, in this extremely important uh, area of work on environmental justice. She has, uh, she will deepen important relationships with advocates, community leaders, and cross-sector partners to ensure environmental justice concerns are incorporated into citywide policy decision-making and implementation. Dr. Christian Branian uh, is co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change and a research scientist um, at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. In his work, Dr. Branian helps stakeholders to use satellite imagery and climate projections to manage cities and water resources. Dr. Branian has served as co-director of the United States Environmental Protection Agency's inaugural Environmental Justice Academy for Community Leaders. He led regional community engagement efforts associated with the Clean Power Plan in four states and was recognized for his service with the White House Climate Action Plan Award. And finally, Dr. Anna Baptista is a, also a member of the New York City Panel on Climate Change and the Associate Director of the Tishman Environment Design Center. She's also Assistant Professor of Professional Practice in the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management Graduate Program 
at the Milano School of, Envir of Policy, Management, and Environment. She serves, um, as I mentioned, as Associate Director of TEDC. Professor Baptista's research and professional practice focuses on environmental and climate justice. She works directly with impacted communities and coalitions to support the advancement of community-led alternatives to achieve environmental justice. And it works on a range of issues related um, to and including state and local EJ policies, cumulative impacts, and goods uh, movement. Anna's professional practice is based primarily in community-engaged scholarship and critical participatory action research. She's an active trustee for several EJ organizations, including the Ironbound Community Corporation, the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, and Gaia. So welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I uh, am going to um, set the stage for this discussion. Uh, and um, in addition, as I, I wanted to say, that in addition to being the director of TEDC and, and a university professor of architecture and sustainable design at the New School, uh, I'm also a member of the faculty of the School of Constructed Environments at Parsons School of Design. And I mentioned that, um, this last point, uh, because the School of Constructed Environments, through its school dean, Robert Kirkbride, and the program directors of its programs in architecture, interior design, lighting design, industrial design, and product design, recently shared a commitment for the school that I think frames our conversation today rather well. And so I thought I would like to begin by reading just a, a quick, a short part of that statement, which is titled, Deconstructing Environments and Decolonizing Pedagogy, Parsons School of Constructed Environment Statement in Support of Anti-Racism, Black Lives Matter, and Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. For this um, critical moment in history, this is the beginning of the, of the statement. For this critical moment in history, the United States and across the world, we simultaneously face three interconnected crises or has been, as has been popular observed, three pandemics. The most recent and literal pandemic is the coronavirus, which has affected the entire world in unprecedented ways over the past six months and shows no indication of diminishing in the near future. Tragically, the COVID-19 pandemic and its isolating impacts has resurfaced and deepened longstanding divides in American life and across the world including systemic racism and oppression, the second pandemic, an enduring global legacy of slavery that has caused acute harm, brutality, death, and injustice to Black Americans over the last 400 years. This tragic legacy coincided with another legacy of abuse, the occupation and appropriation of the Americas through the colonization and sustained oppression, harm, and injustice to indigenous peoples. Among their global implications, these unjust acts and forces have directly built the wealth and power of the United States, building white privilege and operating under the unnamed governance of white supremacy. Both of these crises are intertwined with the third crisis of global climate change. What we as the faculty of Parsons School of Constructed Environments recognize as a climate emergency. These three crises are not entangled by chance. There are long-standing systemic behaviors and deliberate actions that have caused the injustice, death, and destruction we see today. As designers and architects with the distinct privilege of being educators, we have a responsibility to recognize our current predicament and our complicity. Despite decades of ongoing efforts by many, systemic and overt racism has for too long been conveniently ignored or at best unsatisfactorily acknowledged by our white dominated professions, industries, universities, and of course, by our government and institutions. Beyond the first step of recognition, we must take action to attempt real, significant, and enduring change, to be actively anti-racist through our administration, our teaching, our research, and creative practice, and to decolonize our curriculum. This effort must be multifaceted collaborative and ongoing across the School of Constructed Environments, Parsons, and the New School. 
It might be hard to do as we face so many uncertainties simultaneously in all dimensions of our lives, but this hard work is urgent and necessary, and there is no better time to do it than now. That's the end of the statement. Well, it's the end of where I'm going to stop reading it. Um, what I'd like to say is that the SCE statement draws together the three threads that define the challenges of environmental justice in New York City at this particular time. COVID-19, structural racism, and climate change. I would add to these three, however, persistent economic inequality and the financial crisis that has followed in the wake of COVID. The statement from the School of Constructed Environment, however, also ends with a call to action, this call to change. And so I would like to begin our conversation by asking if each of you, Peggy, Adriana, Christian, and Anna, um, could, from your particular perspective, locate the work of environmental justice in the context of these intersecting pandemics. Again, COVID-19, structural racism, climate change, and persistent economic inequality. And speak to the kinds of action that these times demand of us all. So I'd like to start there. And um, Peggy, if I might ask you to begin um, the discussion. Sure, so, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I think I'll start out with just defining environmental justice from, from my perspective. Um, environmental justice is a civil rights analysis of environmental decision making. It's discrimination in the enforcement of laws, the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste disposal and industrial facilities. Um, also includes the permitting um, of polluting facilities in overburdened communities. It includes the exclusion of people of color from uh, staff and boards of mainstream environmental groups, decision-making boards, and regulatory bodies. And environmental racism really saps the strength of communities and really all of society because it's a system of power, of formal and informal structures within government within nonprofits and philanthropy that assigns value to certain groups and communities. And uh, as Dr. Robert Bullard says, some of us do not have the complexion for protection. Also environmental justice organizations really place human health at the center of environmental struggles because the physical environment and our zip code is an important determinant of people of color's health, and certainly African-American health, because we know that African-Americans have escalating health disparities that we have seen um, exacerbated by COVID-19. And certainly one thing that really, I think, raised the visibility of environmental justice uh, for the general public that might not have thought a lot about these issues has been the a uh, disproportionate death of Black Americans in, or Black New Yorkers um, from COVID, um, mostly because, as we know from the Harvard study, uh, because uh, living in air pollution has increased the risk of death and negative outcomes from COVID, especially for Black Americans and Black New Yorkers. So when we think about um, where we go from here, how we advance environmental justice, I really have to think about um, how we begin to invest uh, and map those communities in New York City that are at most uh, at risk and really make an investment in those communities. And I think we saw uh, New York City doing that when they began to see uh, where the, the uh, you know, prevalence of, of deaths from COVID was in New York City. And then combined with the Harvard study, I think they began to realize that ne they needed to put a stronger communications effort into certain communities. And then we saw uh, the city begin began to do that. But I should also say that uh, I'm co-founder and executive director of WEAC for Environmental Justice. We're based in Harlem 
and have a federal policy office in DC. And our theory of change is that we must organize the most affected um, members of our communities and engage them in environmental decision making. And if we do so, we can begin to create healthier uh, and more sustainable communities. And so uh, base building and organizing is an important part of policy making for my organization because we believe that policy ideas need to be uh, identified by the community, that they need to be the ones to educate policymakers and their elected officials, and that they can uh, really begin to help us lead uh, strong campaigns uh, to, to change um, bad policies and, and to create the new ones that we need. So we obviously, as Joel, as you've um, provided a context for, really find ourselves with a, in the midst of a racial pandemic, a COVID pandemic, and a climate change crisis. And we also know that um, the first communities that will be hardest and first hit by climate change and extreme weather um, are actually environmental justice communities uh, that are always already living with a legacy of pollution. And that legacy of pollution, uh, many of us feel, has to be abated and mitigated before we can really begin to have a sustainable community. And so when we um, fold uh, extreme weather events into the uh, continuing legacy of pollution, we know that we have a perfect storm and that those communities are not going to be the ones most resilient uh, to be able to, um, to really adapt to, um, you know, to the kinds of extremes we're going to have to begin to adapt to. Uh, we're not gonna be able to mitigate um, all of the impacts, so we are going to have to adapt and those EJ communities are often less likely able to adapt uh, because in, some, in many cases, they're also very low income. And even though we're talking about New York City, I'll give you a quick example from uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, of why people of color must be involved in environmental decision-making. Um, if New Orleans had really had a representative group in thinking about um, you know, uh, evacuation and thinking about impacts of hurricanes, which they experienced several a year, they would have known that uh, low-income communities did not have a car to evacuate. They would have known that low-income communities did not have a credit card um, to use to go to a hotel. And so those were the people you saw on rooftops asking for help. So we, we, we don't want that situation here in New York City. And we, and we also know that it also can totally disrupt civil society. And we know that we can have climate, climate migrants moving from city to city. Um, you know, we certainly saw folks from the Bahamas trying to get into Florida and being stopped. Um, we also understand climate gentrification which we can also see uh, in Puerto Rico with so many people having left their homes, perhaps selling property and more affluent people flocking in to buy up that property and create a whole new kind of society. So when I think about um, you know, the fact that we now have two environmental justice laws in New York City, one that creates uh, an environmental justice task force the other that creates an environmental justice study, we really begin now after COVID to see how important um, that study is, Adriana. Uh, we're gonna hear from Adriana a little later, but now we really understand how important it is, not only to map those communities and to map the concerns in those communities, but also to map in terms of COVID, where are the communities living um, most at risk from air pollution, so that we can make more of an investment um, and resources into those communities. And of course, investment doesn't always mean money, because we know that the city um, 
is going to have a strong budget shortfall that it's already experiencing. But resources such as, um, you know, uh, health impacts. We know that um, many of our communities are already uh, sicker, do not have access to quality health care. So if those communities are the ones with the most air pollution, how do we really bring health equity into those communities? How do we really focus um, you know, our, our health expertise in those communities? So I certainly want to see going forward a, a strong emphasis on COVID and air quality and environmental justice communities, understanding where they are and who needs the help um, the soonest. We also need a climate roadmap. And, you know, I have been part of uh, a climate roadmap um, convening that uh, the mayor's office with resilience uh, had developed. And uh, it had gotten a little off track, but fortunately, um, I've just heard that we, we're now going to get back on track because that's really important. And it's been one of the few places uh, in the city where uh, grassroots groups have come to really talk about the challenges being faced by their communities. Because, you know, even though it's New York City and we're an urban environment, um, our neighborhoods are very different. Some are at the waterfront. You know, we had, um, you know, so many um, public housing tenants um, without uh, electricity for like two weeks or more who lived out at Coney Island or Red Hook or the far Rockaways. So that's a certain kind of environment in that location. And then you have environments like in Harlem and Washington Heights that, that have you know, a, another kind of difference. And then of course we know that extreme heat is going to hit our communities every single year and that more people die of, um, from extreme heat and, and chronic disease than die from flooding and, uh, and storm surge every year. So we really need to focus on that. And certainly my organization has been very focused on extreme heat, um, understanding um, whether the cooling centers are really the right uh, res re resolution of that problem and how we can really begin to, uh, to pinpoint the communities uh, from a built environment standpoint that are most at risk and how we might bring green infrastructure uh, to those communities to begin to, to mitigate and, and reduce uh, some of that risk of extreme heat. Um, I don't know how my time is, but... Um, I think that's a, that's a good point, Peggy. That's exact, it's a really good point to, to wrap up on this first one. Because so I'm going to wrap up by talking about or just mentioning energy justice, that we need to bring solar. And you know, when we talk about keeping housing affordable and we talk about gentrification, it's about keeping housing affordable and solar uh, and really focused on uh, renewables for, for, for energy um, generation for affordable housing becomes very important. Um, and so we've been working uh, at WEAC to to not only train uh, underemployed folks to do uh, solar installations, but to do that those solar installations on tenant-owned cooperatives to keep them um, as affordable as possible. And so really that whole issue of green jobs, solar, energy, labor, and unions is an issue that we really need to focus on um, you know, in, in the coming months, and, and perhaps we can talk about that uh, later in the program. Right. What, what often gets called a just transition. A just transition. Yeah, super. Thank you, Peggy. And I, I wanted to go right to Adriana to be able to follow up on uh, Peggy's comments because she spoke to the, the two local laws uh, that established the Environmental Justice Advisory Board that Peggy is chairing. Are, it, um, I don't see Adriana. Are you there? Ah, super. <laughs> I'm still here. Um, yeah, so thank you, uh, Joel, to the, and Anna, the New School Tip, for putting this event together. And thank you, Peggy, for opening it up so beautifully uh, and touching on, I think, a lot of uh, really critical points there. Um, I want to start by addressing the 
uh, the four the three or four crises that, that you brought up um, in your statement earlier, Joel, just to say first that this intersection is not, or the intersectionality of this is not new for those in the environmental justice movement in some ways. Like, um, you know, it was a recognition um, decades ago that the income inequality, the economic inequality that exists within the country, the systemic racism, racism that exists in our country, that helped to fuel and create the, in, like, environmental justice communities and like these disparities that we're trying to address now like that's how we got to to where we are in part um and so i would say that there are uh, environmental justice leaders in new york city certainly but across the country as well how, who have been working at this intersection for a very long time uh and i think you know uh the, the pandemic of covid 19 is something obviously that is new uh this year and for me really underscores the um, urgency with which the city needs to do the work of understanding our vulnerabilities to make sound and just policy decisions. And uh, I'll get in a little bit into uh, those local laws and, and what um, where, what my, the program that I'm leading is going to do, but um, just wanted to talk a little bit more about like what I mean by like understanding our vulnerabilities and how, given the context of the pandemic, how I, how that urgency was conveyed to me. So when you think about, um, one of the examples I always think of is uh, the heat vulnerability index that we have in the city that we have created, uh, the Department of Health and others um, helped to create years ago, which looks at um, a whole bunch of different factors, right? They look at social and uh, economic, um, vulnerabilities in addition to heat vulnerability, your access to tree cover, the type of building, you know, that you live in, your access to, you know, um, your likelihood that you have access to um, cooling measures and came up with a, an index that gives a map of who is most vulnerable to heat issues. And because we have that, we are, we as a city are able to make policy and plan based in an equitable way based on that vulnerability. And I think that, you know, um, I would like to get us to a place where we can do that with many other vulnerabilities. And I think, you know, um, COVID-19 brought up a, an issue for me where I, you know, we have um, things that weren't necessarily top of mind for me as urgent. We must look at these top of the list EJ issues like overcrowding in housing, um, you know, as being certainly an issue to pay attention to, but to think about it with the urgency of life or death in the co uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic was something, um, you know, that before this happened, we may not have, have thought about it in that way. And also, you know, in the, ac the access to green space as well as being something that we cared about it is, is articulated in on this in the city sides on our on our one NYC 2050 plan as you know wanting everyone to live uh, within a short walk of a, a park or an open green space. But when we are locked down in our homes and we we're told that we shouldn't leave except just to to get um, fresh air or to do some recreation, your ability to quickly get somewhere where you can breathe fresh air means so much more to your health and your well being. Um, and um, and so I think that's one thing that COVID-19 has sort of highlighted to me that there are so many different things out there that um, we may not even understand the extent of like how vulnerable they can make us depending on what crisis uh, we're confronted with in the moment. Uh, and so the work that um, I'm doing with, with Peggy and with others is um, to implement the city's environmental justice laws that were signed uh, back in 2017. The first uh, requirement of which is to do the city's first ever study of environmental justice um, issues in, in New York City and, um, and really delineating which communities in, within the five boroughs are considered environmental justice areas um, and defining exactly what that means. So, everything from looking at all of the data that the city currently has and evaluating, you know, everything from your access to green space, like I mentioned in your, in your vulnerability heat to heat, uh, to your likelihood to have negative health outcomes based on your zip code or your climate vulnerabilities, really just to give us a picture of 
um, how environmental justice, like, uh, environmental injustice has impacted communities throughout New York, what the disparities are, um, and in a way that can put us in a position, you know, if we're faced with, you know, when we're faced with the next crisis, we have that foundation that we can act and make policy decisions based on that more rapidly. Um, you know, I, and um, I think um, a lot of that has to do, um, you know, with um, like our ability to grapple with the historic injustice, injustices that got us here, um, as well as looking at, you know, the state of EJ right now, right? Like we have to, we have to look at um, where our disparities are now, but it's as equally as important for me to uh, grapple with, you know, what are the, the systems, the processes, protocols, and like the way that we make decisions that created the, these differences between our communities. Why does one community have twice as high of, of an asthma rate? Or why do they have twice as many um, waste transfer stations in, in this zip code versus other zip code? And, and recognizing that, you know, however intentional or, or, or unintentional there are, um, it was, you know, systemic racism and economic inequality, it sort of fueled these differences in the first place. And so, um, I would say that's um, for first and foremost on my mind is it's doing a study that can help us understand our vulnerabilities so we can make better decisions. Um, beyond that study, we are also going to uh, be producing a, a interactive map and data portal tool, uh, which is uh, will be available online to anyone where, uh, you know, in the future, theoretically, you can go in and put your zip code and understand what environmental justice looks like in your neighborhood. How do you stack up against the citywide average on things like um, air quality or, you know, uh, investment in renewable energy in your community or any other number of things? Uh, and also has a, what I think is really important, a, a data portal component to it where we give you access to uh, the city's own data on these environmental outcomes. Uh, and, and I think that's really important from a data justice perspective. We, to, we need to make sure that um, communities that are on the front lines have access to um, this data so that they can, they have some self-determination in like building community-based plans for, for, their, for their own community, whether it's on climate resiliency, whether it's on, you know, future community development um, or, um, you know, just just uh, be, get, being able to advocate for themselves and for their own community. I think we like as a city, something that I want to bring is the ability, like, to, for those communities to have easier access to um, environmental data for their own community. Thank you, Adriana. That's um, a really good uh, lead-in uh, and um, comprehensive assessment of the of the work that the Environmental Justice Advisory Board is undertaking. And um, Christian, if I could ask you to maybe follow this um, based on those same prompts and, and the perspective from the ways in which uh, resiliency and NPCC play a role. Oh, well, thank you, Joel. And I'm so pleased to join this conversation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. This is a mayor appointed advisory group of researchers with expertise that that advise the city on resiliency. Um, and uh, as the co-chairs have come together to plan for the fourth assessment of the NPCC, um, we realize in this moment how critical it is that we incorporate or integrate, I should say, racial justice and racial equity um, into climate resiliency for the city. Um, there's, there's lots of plans um, existing in the city and, and previous uh, NPCC assessments have touched on equity. Um, there's, there's really actually no shortage of plans and concepts and um, folks I collaborate with, such as Anel Hernandez uh, with New York City uh, EGA, um, have pointed this out. Um, the, the obstacle seems to be the, in the implementation. You know, how do we move beyond uh, just plans and concepts um, to implementation? Some of this just comes from uh, the nature of our society, you know, so many of us are socialized not to talk about race, not to talk about racism our whole lives. So to, to actually even discuss racism 
uh, as painful and difficult for many folks uh, to try to address it um, just seems completely insurmountable in, in some situations. Um, what I'm encouraging uh, my colleagues at NPCC to do and, and my co-chairs, and I think I have you know, significant buy-in, um, is, is for us to explicitly integrate um, anti-racist policies into our work. Um, to me, this is quite feasible and doable. Um, if, if, you, if in the US we can have uh, deliberately racist policies like redlining, um, uh, persist across the U.S. Uh, there's no reason that we can't be deliberate about preventing gentrification, um, that we can't be uh, deliberate about ensuring racial equity and justice. And so to this end, I've started planning uh, with my colleagues a workshop where we'll bring in um, leading experts uh, in racial equity and racial justice uh, to help us think through what would, what would um, uh, urban planning and urban design for resiliency look like uh, if it was deliberately anti-racist. And, and we know that we need experts because, again, we've, the legacy um, of our work as urban planners and designers and scientists um, includes quite a bit of, of, of racism, but we have not deliberately tried to um, reverse these actions. And so um, we're hoping that we can work with organizations um, like Black Space uh, uh, to, to make some, a big difference uh, with the NPCC fourth assessment. Um, and, and we hope that this effort, um, you know, can help decolonize urban planning and design for resiliency. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist and an engineer. And so, um, you know, throughout my work with the geosciences, um, it, it's become quite evident that um, this is not limited to just uh, planners and designers. This is also part of the scientific community. Um, and so we all actually have to educate ourselves. Um, if we've grown up here in the United States, uh, we've grown up um, in a society where uh, we, we, we end up um, taking on prejudices and biases, biases and, and we have to come to grips with that and so in some cases re-educate ourselves. I think uh, education institutions have a key role to play and they can really um, lift the voices of advocacy organizations and activists um, this is delicate and difficult in some cases because uh, some of these, some of the universities and colleges and educational institutions uh, may be perceived as a threat to the community. So we need to work to repair these relationships and make sure that professors and researchers that are legitimately interested in environmental justice um, are not just creating new studies and plans, um, but actually helping, uh, helping with implementation, helping making sure that the plans um, that exist are actually implemented um, instead of just you know furthering their own careers um, uh, by stating that they're involved uh, with environmental justice. Um, and so with the city, um, I, I'm hoping that I can bring together some uh, education institutions um, as well as NPCC members to um, help develop some metrics where we can track uh, equity uh, better. You know, right now. Um, uh, we don't always use metrics that are that are really meaningful. Um, you know, meaningful metrics to me would be deaths, uh, hospitalizations. Um, are we really implementing policies and programs uh, that make a difference, that change public health, safety, uh, and encourage workforce and economic development? Um, I'm also advocating for systems approaches um, so that infrastructure is not uh, changed in a siloed way, but we, we have transit-oriented development that uh, brings informal transit, brings biking to communities, uh, but also enhances their resiliency. And we think through scenarios where there's power outages um, and, and other um, infrastructure failures and make sure that the most vulnerable folks are protected. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with um, you, Joel, as, as well as Otto, who's sitting on this panel today um, to advance environmental climate justice and, and also looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Christian. Um, that's a perfect lead into Anna, um, not just because she was called out, <laughs> but also because um, there's been so much, I think, really successful work on the policy front uh, as well of late. Um, Anna, I'm gonna hand it over to you with that prompt. 
I love getting called in, especially being the, the Newark girl on a New York City panel, <laughs> <laughs> reflecting on New York City. So that this is a, a rare occasion, so I'll do my best. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I would say that from, from my vantage point, um, I see so much opportunity in the political moment that we're in, even though we're under a tremendous amount of, um, of stress and um, trauma in this country. Um, it's also uh, an opportunity because systems under pressure uh, produce significant ruptures and changes. And these are the moments that um, we are primed to act in. And I think I am really, really humbled by um, the work that's happening in New York City and across the country by environmental justice organizations like WE Act and so many others um, that have um, been preparing and organizing and building their base um, and developing those policies from the ground up that in these moments of political transition and upheaval um, may have an opportunity to um, you know, burst onto the scene, so to speak. Uh, there's also, of course, tremendous risk in repression and backsliding and, and uh, regressiveness as well. So there, the risk runs both ways, certainly in these times, especially of economic constriction. But, um, but I know that um, in, for example, uh, we have a mayoral election coming up. Uh, there's obviously a presidential election and, and lots of local congressional elections happening all over the country and right here in our region. All of these um, present opportunities to push hard on, um, on changes that maybe break from the status quo of how we've always done climate and energy policy in the past that maybe has been um, for example, more carbon centric and more focused on parts per million and less on environmental justice and equity um, outcomes. And so, you know, there, there could be opportunities to really recenter and refocus um, these policies in a way that is not just sprinkling EJ and equity, you know, uh, you know, I, I always call it the sprinkling, you know, the trickle down, you know, we'll, the EJ will come, don't worry, it's just a matter of it trickling down to the communities and instead actually making it the heart and the core of what drives these policies. Because if you truly believe that these different crises, structural racism, you know, COVID-19, this global pandemic, uh, climate change, are all parts of the same systemic forces. Um, then if you center equity and racial justice, um, then you'll, you'll, you'll kill multiple birds with, <laughs> with that stone, right? Um, but if you, you know, um, I think we have suffered from a lack of ambition and a lack of really, um, you know, being too afraid, you know, and I, I'm speaking of lots of like, for example, mainstream environmental organizations or groups that have not dreamed big enough. <laughs> um, and in doing so have really um, done more harm than good in terms of really advancing much more forward looking justice centered policies that uh, will benefit um, the communities that will be hit the hardest. So um, I think there's also tremendous lessons, you know, to be learned from the innovation um, and the experimentation that that EJ groups are doing all over the country, right? Um, and we see at the at everywhere from the national level policy making that's happening on lots of there's tons of federal bills coming out right now on EJ and climate equity that is are being informed by um, environmental justice organizations. Um, there's also lots of state level work, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, California have, uh, you know, in the last year, I've heard about more um, climate and EJ bills coming out and successfully winning and pushing through. And then at the local level, you know, last year I had the opportunity to do a land use assessment, um, a, a landscape assessment of local land use and municipal policies that were focused on environmental justice. And we looked at over 40 cities across the country and most of the um, EJ policies that were uh, being pushed at the municipal level were coming from EJ organizations advocacy and campaigns from the bottom up 
uh, and really pushing their municipalities, their, their, the levels of government that uh, are most accountable usually to, to, to these groups um, on reforming their land use and zoning, on using public health ordinances and shifting public health ordinances, um, on putting in permit and development reviews that include environmental justice and cumulative impacts, um, things like uh, initiating green zones in EJ communities, you know, and targeting investments on green zone. You know, these are all ideas that came from EJ communities across the country that are finding their way um, into cities um, across the country. So um, I was inspired by that because, you know, I think to what Christian's point was, is um, a lot of the legacy of structural racism that we see in the built environment doesn't just go away coincidentally. It requires affirmative, really targeted and explicit anti-racist policies. And it requires a package of those things. It has to happen at multiple scales using lots of different tools. It's messy. Um, and so, but we're not gonna get there if we just wait for it to sort of be an addendum to the work that we do. And so EJ communities, and I think EJ organizations are leading the way in demanding more and more of the policy agenda um, and no longer, you know, waiting on the sidelines to be that on. Um, they have policy initiatives and reforms and changes that they wanna see at the local level. Um, so I'm really hopeful about, even in these times of economic constriction, about the possibilities, not only of dealing with the legacy of environmental injustice in New York City, which I think is really important, you know, mapping out where we know we have those, those problems, um, but also looking forward at like, what are the pathways? What are the, what's the portfolio and package of tools we're gonna need to invest and reinvest in communities, uh, rebuild them um, and you know we're gonna need federal dollars to do that we're gonna need state dollars to do that um, the cities are not going to be able to do it on their own um, so I think it's it's really an important time to start putting that together because you know the ingredients for successfully getting to wins requires not just the political opportunity moment you know to push your policy through but like decades of like cooking up the <laughs> The what, what are the actions that are going to be needed? What are the policies that are, you know, going to be possible? Um, and then the base building, right? Like building the, the base of folks that are going to be activated and building the pressure on our decision makers and our lawmakers to say when the moment is right, they're going to show up at the doorstep and say, you're accountable to us. You better pass this bill um, or you better make this investment in our community. So we need all of those ingredients happening um, and it's, and it's, more important now than ever that we're organized and ready to take advantage of these moments of um, potential ruptures. So I think I'll, I'll end there and I can put a link to that land use um, report that came out in case, in case folks wanna check out. I know New York, New York City's um, EJ bills are, are featured in there as well, so. Thank you, Anna. Um, and in a few minutes, Mike is gonna uh, join us with questions from the chat. So anybody who has, I see they've been coming in. I um, have declared that I can't walk and chew gum at the same time, which means I can't Zoom and chat at the same time. So um, Mike's gonna come in with some questions, uh, but I just wanted to go back to each of you building on Anna's last comment and, and just ask the question of crisis management versus planful um, change. Uh, because I, I think, um, you know, Anna's right that there's incredible opportunity and Adriana makes the point that, uh, that these intersectional uh, conditions have existed for a very long time and EJ movements have been, have been working in that space. And yet the sort of the momentum, the building momentum of wildfires, of, um, of racial injustice, of economic inequality, um, do feel as if they have created a situation in which we are in crisis management. And one of the risks, as Anna said, of crisis management is actually going the opposite direction, becoming more conservative and retrenching and reestablishing past strategies rather than making the kind of big leap um, that, that is necessary. So if you could each speak about, like, how do we really, and Anna started it, but 
I think there's so much at stake right now. Uh, and crisis management is a tough place to make real change. You know that what we're going to hear next is there's no money to do anything. Right? That's the, that's the next thing we're going to be told. We had trillions of dollars to spend, but we don't have another trillion to spend to do this. So how do we make sure that trillions more are spent? Really driven by this notion of justice at the core. Wow, this is good. I, I wanted to defer to, to Peggy and Anna and Adriana, but they didn't jump in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm newer to New York. Uh, than, than I think the, the other three panelists. And I, I think that's actually an advantage because in some ways, because um, I'm not locked into to historical ways of thinking here. Um, what, I, what I think is that um, when I observe development in New York, uh, it's still very attractive to develop in areas that are threatened by sea level rise um, and, and coastal flooding. Um, this is still happening quite a bit. And uh, there's a real opportunity um, whenever there's development, whether it's in flood zones or outside of flood zones, um, just to make sure that there's always um, affordable housing uh, associated with that development. New York is such an attractive place to live and, and, and a place that brings people from all over the world. Um, th there were discussions about, uh, because of the pandemic, people leaving New York and fleeing from New York. And I think we know that that, we know now that that's not the case, that uh, New York um, has thrived and will continue to thrive and, and will resurge. Um, and so I think there's a real opportunity to be a little more bold um, in, 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 a way, in a way that Anna mentioned to saying that um, we're gonna be proactive about making sure there's affordable housing and making sure folks uh, have a place to live that's safe and healthy. And I say that um, in part because environmental justice is so much centered on where people live. Um, and if only uh, certain people um, have, are safe from flooding and, and other environmental hazards, um, then, we, then we really can't have environmental justice. So I'm hoping um, that through uh, various initiatives and programs, New York City and other cities um, will not make it an addendum uh, but make uh, very strong incentives, if not requirements, um, so that uh, new, new affordable housing is created. And there's also this possibility of transit-oriented development, where um, we don't think of transit and, and uh, development in terms of buildings in, in siloed ways, but we, we plan them together, district-level planning, if you will, um, where we're planning whole districts and having whole areas um, that ensure that there's affordable housing, that ensure people uh, live close to where uh, or they have opportunities to live close to where they work. Uh, so I'll stop there, but that's, that's one um, thing I'd like to offer. Hmm. I guess what I wanted to say is that we have to vote. We have to develop an agenda. We have mayoral race next year. Um, something like 75% of the city council we, will be up. And I think it's incumbent on us to begin to develop agendas that we hold candidates accountable to. Uh, I know at WE Act, we are working to uh, organize NYCHA tenants to develop uh, an agenda. And we've started a C4 organization uh, to begin to hold candidates accountable to that agenda. Uh, and the same thing is happening at the, at the national level with the presidential campaign. Um, many of us have been working to develop recommendations uh, on how we're going to invest in frontline communities, you know, how we're going to invest our resources in those communities, um, how we're going to begin to bring uh, affected communities into environmental decision making. Um, but, you know, I do see hope in some of the processes that have already begun. You know, we, we've had a clean heat program in New York City that has worked to, you know, increase uh, or decrease uh, air pollution. We've got Local Law 97, I was on an advisory board for that this morning, uh, that's working to reduce emissions from our buildings and thinking about how we finance that and thinking very specifically about the lower income 
uh, buildings uh, in in low income communities. You know, I'm thinking about the you know uh, climate protection and community leadership act uh, at the state level that has a climate action council focused on just transition and environmental justice. So I think there's some bright lights we can see where there is strong engagement uh, by affected communities uh, and there is some investment there because there is money. The issue is where does the money go? What are our priorities? And I think we have to begin um, really stating clearly what the priorities of the voters are for how that money is used. You know, we see a lot of giveaways to developers. When we talk about affordable housing, you know, um, Christian, you mentioned affordable housing. Well, you know, a lot of us think very differently about what's affordable. Um, some affordable housing in uptown communities absolutely is not affordable for, for an average uh, income in that community. So what is affordable housing? And are we giving away too much in tax credits and incentives to developers to actually only develop a very tiny amount of affordable housing, not enough to meet the actual demand? Um, you know, the federal government just started opportunity zones. East Harlem is in an opportunity zone, yet there's no interaction between community engagement and what those entrepreneurs, what kinds of jobs they're going to create. I, I understand they could create a hot dog stand and still get, uh, you know, the, some of these tax incentives. Um, you know, you talk about uh, transit-oriented development. Well, you know, REACT has been working in East Harlem on the 125th Street Commercial Corridor, where you've got Metro North with thousands hundreds of thousands of commuters coming into East Harlem. You've got the Second Avenue subway that will be there. You've got the Lexington Avenue train and the place looks like a disaster area. You couldn't get a cup of coffee if you had to, to wait an hour. Um, there's no restaurant other than, you know, some fast food joint where you could sit and, well, nobody reads a newspaper, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Except maybe some of us here, but, but sit and read something while you're waiting for a train or use a bathroom in Metro North that's actually open. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous. You know, so you, you've got all of these commuters coming into a neighborhood and none of the money's being left in that neighborhood. And, and so, you know, again, there's so many areas like that. We see all the money being put down you know, on 34th Street and there are these nice, um, you know, uh, public, public plazas, but, and public plazas are being developed around the city, but are they being developed in some of the lower income communities? Apparently not. So again, those kinds of equity considerations, um, you know, we, we really need to, to begin to monitor, are they really happening? You know, under Bloomberg, we have the million trees, but I, we still don't have trees on 135th Street. And it, it's like um, when there's extreme heat, oh my God, the heat is blinding. Um, but there are no trees on that whole 135th Street corridor from uh, Riverside, um, you know, over to Amsterdam Avenue, for instance. And I'm sure that's the case in so many communities. Um, so we really have not used the equity lens that we've been hearing about. And we really need to do that. And to do that, um, communities have got to start developing their agenda and ensuring that their electeds are going to uh, implement it. Yeah. Candidate accountability. I, I, love, the, I love the sound of that as, a, as an ambition. And you know, I would remind everybody that it, it's 1948 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes housing, right? The right, the, the, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being is, is part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So how do we not have housing in, the, in New York City that lives up to that standard? Well, clean water and clean air. You know, some people are talking about we need an environmental bill of rights. Adriana, you want to add anything to that? And then Mike, we're going to invite you in to ask a couple questions. 
I, I do. I do want to add a little bit uh, just to say that it be, because my background and my heart, I think, is, is as one of an advocate, uh, although I am a new city employee, but, um, you know, just to get to your question, Joel, of, you know, how do we make sure we're not just doing an immediate crisis response, but actually going deeper and going beyond to address, address root issues? I would say one is like, it is for, from my perspective as like for the city's um, EJ program is we're mandated by law to look further and to look deeper um, into our systemic like, root causes of these issues. And so um, we have the mandate of the law to, to make sure that we're doing that. Um, at the same time, there are, you know, you know, thousands of city employees who dropped everything to do crisis response, you know, um, in the midst of the, of the pandemic. Um, and so that's, that's one thing is, you know, having that mandate. The other thing, which I think both Peggy and Joel, you were getting at is accountability for that, for that law to make sure that people like myself and decision makers and elected officials are fulfilling, um, fulfilling those laws, meeting deadlines and, and, and doing things in a way that is, um, uh, inclusive of the communities that are that are most impacted that takes into account their lived experiences and um you know it it something that that goes more more deep and, and more systemic and so i think um because my heart is still one of an advocate i think that that is the most important thing is for for all new yorkers to hold people accountable um to to deliver on this and to not give up on the drumbeat of um like addressing the, the root issues of economic inequality and environmental and racism and um, racial injustice um, writ large. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I didn't want to cut you out of that since you, you actually drove us in this direction. Anything to add before Mike jumps in with questions? I, no, I, I think uh, Peggy and Adriana addressed it beautifully. And, I, you know, I would say like, there's always the people who are like austerity, right, in times like this. And I think um, there's lots of examples all over the world where we can show that social spending actually has better results than austerity. Um, and, and, like, and like Peggy and Adriana said, it's about accountability, about the kind of investments we make. So Mike, why don't we invite you in. Christian, did you want to, I saw you clarified in the chat. Um, what was meant by affordability did you want to speak that and then yeah you know and, and I, I i thank peggy for saying that and i think uh looks like lewis in the chat for for also flagging the term affordable housing you know what i mean when i say affordable i mean affordable for low-income folks and i recognize that yeah what what often is passed on as affordable really isn't affordable um to peggy's point i think we have to have much more uh much more bold um, requirements in terms of the amount of of housing that low income folks uh, that's available for low income folks in new developments, and there's really no reason we can't do this. Um, developer, the, I think the development community will still be able to make a profit, and it's just it's just a lack of, of willpower. And I think um, uh, to all, to other panelists' point, we just have to hold uh, our leaders accountable to make sure that this happens. Uh, okay, Mike. Somehow you're going to make sense of this chat thread and, and throw a couple questions into the mix. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a, sorry, there's a question here that's actually about hope. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to see what you all think about that because that is something very hard to find in this time. But the question is actually, um, what is your greatest hope as we face economic constrictions, not only for things that we avoid, but for positive changes? Greatest hope? Yeah, yeah, hope. I have a lot of hope. Um, I, I channel my hope from, actually from those younger than I am and um, how on fire and awake they seem to be much more so than my generation, the millennial generation or, or, or others um, older than that. And, um, you know, so this has been an incredibly like traumatic and emotionally taxing year for um, 
for a lot of us um, and for lots of different reasons. And I, I try to maintain hope just knowing that like, it seems that those um, in like Gen Z seem to just be unwavering in their commitment to addressing the climate crisis and their commitment to fighting for justice. And um, that gives me hope. Well, you know, I have hope because, you know, you really can develop a vision and implement it. And I see that every day in my community uh, and in communities uh, around the country. I, I am, you know, people talk about well, who are your models, who inspires you. There's so many everyday people who inspire me, my other colleagues who inspire me. You know, um, Anna and uh, Nikki Sheets in New Jersey, who finally have a cumulative impact bill, the first in the whole country. I am inspired by Anna and Nikki. Uh, and that's what gives me hope. Um, and, and what I realized, because we're, when you're in this in, for the long haul, we started 32 years ago at WEAC. What you realize is that you develop those visions, you develop um, even those recommendations, and you wait for that window of opportunity. And once you have that window of opportunity, you are ready to roll. And, you know, maybe younger people uh, think like, you know, we worked 18 years in a campaign to get the MTA to convert every single bus to a hybrid. Um, 18 years is a long time, but every time I see a bus roll by that's a hybrid, I have a smile on my face and I know that, you know, we did something right and now they're going to electrify and now we're starting another school bus campaign. And so I have hope for all those things because good things do squeeze in. And if we have the right political moment, um, you know, if we have the right political moment in November, it is going to be so exciting. Um, there is going to be so much activity. It, it's going to be overwhelming. And um, so, you know, those are the things that give me hope, even at, at a neighborhood level, just coming up with a plan and being able to implement it. And we can do that. And it, and it does happen. And it does happen uh, somewhere in this country every single day. And we have the climate, you know, protection law at the, at the state level, the most, you know, uh, broad based in the whole country. And we did that in, I don't know, five or six years, um, but probably really just the last two or three, just, you know, really intense. Um, so yeah, I mean, good things are happening. <laughs> a lot of bad things too. <laughs> I, I I, I did want to, I see there are a number of questions that keep coming back to austerity, financing, um, available funds for change, all in this category. And I, I did want to put it back to the group um, in this context. And I, my own contribution, I would say, to the discussion, uh, and one of the things we've been talking about in NPCC, is how to really quantify av avoided costs. Because it feels to me that, um, a lot of the crisis management and short-term thinking around existing systems of perpetuating systems of inequality and injustice, both um, economically and environmentally and racially, um, never get at the true cost of those actions, which are always astronomically higher than investing in the change necessary to address them. In fact, it's usually the opposite. That investment pays back multiple times. So I think part of the answer to the question that we're um, being asked on the, on the economic front is the work we need to be able to do to communicate collectively the essential nature of investment in, in a just transition and the benefit that that brings. But I'm curious, to the panelists, if you see it that way, or if there are things you would add to that statement. You know, there have been some organizations that have looked at the uh, transportation related air quality hospitalizations. And it, it's millions, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. 
um, in, in, in emergency room visits for air quality. Um, do we really look at that, at that cost? Do we look at the cost of uh, lost school days, lost work days? You know, we, there are actually some people who do aggregate that, but it, it's like it doesn't exist. Nobody really takes that into account. You know, if we looked at what's the true cost of all the tax credits and the tax incentives that we're giving to developers to develop new jobs. Um, and of course, the most underemployed never get one of those jobs. You know, what's the true cost of that? And do we need to use our tax money that way? Maybe we need to take that bundle of money and use it for affordable housing or in some other way, or to invest in NYCHA. We have a crisis in public housing. People are living in squalid conditions that it, are impacting their health, their well-being, their mental health, and everybody's just going, you know, all, along with life as if it doesn't exist. There's something like 600,000 people living in NYCHA. If, if that's the size of like Boston. And people are living in terrible conditions and we need to be putting money there and not in some other things. So again, there's money and how are we going to prioritize the way to use it? And I think I see, as Nadia points out, a lot of that falls into the language of externalization as well. That's right. Thank you, Bhavani, for that post. I'm learning to walk in Chugam at the same time. Mike, do you, do you have another question for us? Because we're running up to the 445, which is our stopping point. So if you have one last question for this amazing panel, um, to round out this conversation, that would be terrific. Oh, yeah, sure. I think there, there's something I've seen that's popped up a few times, which basically comes down to um, in the sort of environmental justice, climate justice, resilience work. Um, how can we get the actual communities that are affected by this more involved in the process um, of, of fighting against these um, adverse impacts? Uh, for example, like how accessible open are advisory boards, community meetings? community district board, things like that? Like how can people directly get involved? I'd like to uh, stab at answering that one. Um, just a plug for becoming a member of your local environmental justice community-based organization, for sure, definitely, first thing. Um, second thing is, is how to get involved in the EJ um, policies as they're being Im implemented. So. Um, there is public engagement that is mandated and built into the local laws um, to be um, facilitated by uh, the Environmental Justice Advisory Board, of which Peggy is the chair. Uh, but there are, are 14 others, uh, many of them are, are um, representatives from EJ communities and EJ organizations. Uh, but the, the standard that's laid out in that law, um, I would consider um, a, a minimum standard. So what, what we are mandated to do is, is do uh, five town hall meetings, one in each borough. Whenever we have a draft of the uh, environmental justice plan, which um, just to draw back to my summary from earlier, is the third part of the process, right? We have the study, we have the data portal, and then we have the plan on how we're actually going to work um, environmental justice into the city's decision-making processes uh, and, and protocol. So um, when I accepted, you know, the, the position and, and joined the administration, uh, I came, I came on and, and one of the first conversations I had with the advisory board is, is this seems like not enough and this seems like too late in the process. And um, I am hoping to build out a much more inclusive process in partnership with the advisory board, uh, which we, and we actually have a meeting to discuss that uh, coming up um, on next Tuesday, um, how exactly we do that in light of the economic situation that we're in and the pandemic that we're in, like how can we get communities involved? But um, a couple of like big picture values that I have is um, I want to make sure that lived experiences of people in EJ areas are reflected in the the study and the portal somehow. 
you know, whether that be, you know, part of our charge of what we have to do is, is to delineate what are the EJ issues manifesting in these areas. And we can look at the city's data to figure that out, but that's not the same thing as having a lived experience every day of living in that community. And so making sure we're creating channels to um, hear from New Yorkers of what their experiences are, that way we can reflect that in, in the study uh, it is one, I think, important idea. And then the other is, you know, giving them a voice in um, earlier in the EJ plan process. That way, before we're putting out recommendations on how to better incorporate environmental justice in the city's decision making, we've already done our due diligence and spoken to communities about that. Um, and so, um, a lot of that, you know, is to be determined, uh, but to give you the sense of like what the minimum standard of the law is, it's those five uh, town hall meetings. And I'm, I'm very eager to work, uh, you know, with Peggy and with other, um, and, and possibly even the New York City panel on climate change, who, you know, wants to do some outreach uh, of, their, of, their, them, of their own to EJ uh, communities, hoping to work with them to build something out that's much more robust and isn't sort of a, this process, which I would consider um, extractive, frankly, of creating a plan without a community input and then taking that plan to a community and saying, hey, look at this thing that you had no input on. Let us know what you think about it. Um, you know, I'm trying to, to do things that are in a, a more just way. That's why my position and my program exists in the first place. So we have to make sure that the way that we're doing our work is reflective of the, the future uh, that we're trying to build in the city. So Adriana, we're going to give you the last word. <laughs> and, um, and I think on that aspiration, um, to thank uh, all of our panelists um, for a really robust and important and thoughtful and impassioned conversation. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Mayor's Office for Climate Policies and Planning and the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, both of which play central roles in the work that was just described, um, the New School, and of course, my colleagues at the Tishman Environment and Design Center, Mike Harrington, who you all saw, uh, Anna Yulsman, who you didn't see, but who we couldn't have done this without, um, and, uh, and to say that this is the work of our time. And with colleagues like all of you uh, in the lead, um, it, that's what gives me hope. Uh, so thank you, and um, and we will continue this work. Stay safe, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.